Good stuff. All right. I believe in divine appointments, don't you? I believe that there are moments where there are divine circumstances that meet together for the will of God. I call these things God sequences. When there's a God sequence, you're in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. That's one of the best descriptions that I could say uh, for what, how do you describe the will of God? It is when you are in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. So if you have a phone or want to capture that, write that down, write it down because this is one of the things in life that produces miracles. When God has given you instructions to go to the right place at the right time and you're doing the right thing, God sequences happen. Now, many of you uh, understand will, or will be understanding what I'm talking about today when, when the Lord has used you in a particular way that you didn't know he was going to, to use you in that way and it produced a miracle in somebody's life. Um, I like to keep little mementos of uh, my spiritual journey to remind me of what God has done. Uh, and so I've got a drawer at home and I've got several little things. If you've ever, ever been on a walk to Emmaus, walk to Emmaus is, is really big on this where they'll give you a little bracelet that's got a scripture on it or a little cross or a little stone or something to, to mark a moment uh, in life that uh, you can remember or identify the Lord's grace with. And one of my favorite things that remind me of the grace of Jesus and his will working in my life in God's sequences are these brass knuckles. Anybody got any pair of these? It's not illegal. Oh, yes, there he is. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's not illegal to carry brass knuckles in the state of Alabama, but it is illegal to use them, which is the most bizarre set of laws in our state. I just think it's stupid. Uh, brass knuckles right here. And I'll tell you more about this in just a minute, but um, these are precious to me. Very, very precious to me. Being in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. If you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 8. Get your Kindle out or your, your phone and if you don't have a Bible with you. Um, Acts chapter 8 is the, Acts, first of all, is the fifth book in the New Testament. It's after uh, the book of John. It was written by a man named Luke, who is a Gentile believer in Jesus, and Luke is our historian. He's hearing firsthand accounts of the ministry of Jesus through the apostles, and he's writing them down for us. The book of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are actually one book that was separated into two by theologians many centuries ago because the, the Gospel of Luke is the ministry of Jesus on earth. The Gospel uh, or the book of Acts is an account of the church after the day of Pentecost. It's the ministry of Jesus through his people. And so when you read the book of Luke and the book of Acts together, you get one big story. And so I'm, I'm very thankful for the, for the way that God used Luke's life to bring us the information that we need to see how the church is supposed to operate. Now, we're going to be talking about a guy named Philip. Philip is one of the 12 apostles. He's one of the, the ones that were intimately involved in the ministry of Jesus. The moment that we come to the story that we're about to read, I want to give you a little bit of context because context is key when reading scripture. You have to know who is writing it. Who are they writing it to? What's the socio-economical, political uh, environment that's going on and why they are writing it, all right? And so when Luke writes these stories down, he's helping us see a glimpse into uh, the way that God designed the church. So right before the moment that we're about to read, the day of Pentecost has come. The church in Jerusalem is blowing up in a good way. People are coming to, to Christ. They're getting saved. They're being baptized. The spiritual gifts are manifesting. People are getting healed. Eyes are being opened that are blind. People are deaf. are coming uh, and hearing. Miracles are happening. It's an amazing time to be in the church. And this man, Philip, is sent by the Lord down to the area in Israel where the Samaritan people live. The Samaritans were kind of like half Jew, half Gentile. They had intermarried. They were very, very, very much disliked by the Jewish people. In matter of fact, if you needed to get somewhere and your best 
uh, shortest route was to go through Samaria. They would take an extra day of traveling to go around it just because they didn't want to be near Samaritans. But we know through the ministry of Jesus that Jesus loved the Samaritan people. He visited the Samaritan area. He preached the gospel to them. Uh, he met with the Samaritan woman at the well. We know that Jesus' heart is for these people. And so Philip goes down into the area and he preaches the gospel. The Lord works miracles through his life. Uh, people receive Christ. They're baptized. Revival breaks out in that area. And it's a great, great thing. Awesome thing. And then we're going to come to verse 26 of Acts 8. Now, you would think that in a revival, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to put down some roots. We're going to start a church. We're going to plan events. We're going to have potlucks. It's going to be awesome, right? But in Philip's life, check out what the Lord does. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south down the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Stop. <laughs> That's all the instruction that was given to him. Great things are happening. Revival's breaking out. What am I supposed to do next, Lord? Take a walk down a dirt road into the desert. Does that sound like good information? No. There's a couple of details left out of there. Well, how far am I supposed to walk, Lord? Lord? How far am I supposed to walk? What am I supposed to do when I get there? What, what, what are the marching orders? The Lord doesn't give him anything except I want you to go walk down a dirt road into the desert. Verse 27. So he started out. Four of the most powerful words in all of the book of Acts. So he started out. See, Philip had been in a relationship with Jesus for so long and had seen so much and had so great a faith, he didn't need the details, he didn't need the information, he, he did not need what, whether it was safe or whether it was not safe or who he was supposed to see or what he was supposed to do. Philip gets an instruction, he's like, okay, here we go. So he started out. So much of the advancement of the kingdom of God in 2023 is hindered by us not so he just went out. A lot of times we don't go out because we are details people and confirmation people and we need to understand what am I supposed to do God I need to have some details and I need to make sure that it's safe and it's not going to mess up my future if I obey you in this area. He says that, that Philip so we started out he doesn't even know why he's going or how far to go. On his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Now, we need to understand context here. This is a affluent and powerful man. He is not traveling by himself. He has an entourage. He is very wealthy. Someone is driving his chariot. We're going to see that in a minute. So he's got servants with him. More than likely, he has bodyguards with him because he has a lot of money, and he's in charge of the treasury of the Ethiopia. Not only that, but he possesses a, cop a copy of the scroll of Isaiah. The significance of that is huge. You just don't have copies of the book of Isaiah in this day and time. There are no bookstores where you just go out and buy a copy of Isaiah. You've got to have a lot of affluence to own a copy of Isaiah. If you're a rabbi in a city, you might have that copy in the temple uh, of your city. But this guy is just reading his copy as he's going down the road. It's a big deal. So the spirit, verse 29, told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Second command by the Lord also doesn't contain enough information. He doesn't tell him what to do when he gets to the chariot. He doesn't tell him anything except go near the chariot and stay near it. Now, this is an absurd command because Philip is a nobody in the eyes of the world. He's not affluent. He doesn't have a lot of power. He has no political clout. He has no authority. And not only that, God didn't tell him that he was going to be meeting a dignitary that day, so he probably didn't have on his best slacks and collared shirt. He wasn't prepared to meet a dignitary, right? So there's probably some intimidation going up to somebody's chariot that probably has some guards and he's probably got this entourage, but the Lord says, I want you to go up to this chariot, all right? So, again... <laughs> 
Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip sees the opportunity. He sees that God has opened the door. How do I know if it's the will of God? Well, if God opens the door that good, you don't need to pray about it. Philip asked, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led to a sheep, like a sheep to the slaughter and a lamb before shears the silent. He did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who could speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? In, in Christianity, this is called prevenient grace. It is the grace of Jesus that prepares someone to hear the gospel. The Lord had placed it on this Ethiopian eunuch at a certain time, at a certain place, in a certain moment to be reading from this scroll in this chapter. And God had specifically and divinely sent Philip to be at that place in that moment for that specific reason, to share the good news of Jesus with him. And we see this. He asked Philip, tell me, who is the prophet talking about? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture, told him the good news of Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? In between the verses 35 and 38, this man accepts Christ as the Messiah. He confesses, I believe in Jesus, the Messiah. And, and Philip tells him the way to be, ba the way to be baptized. So he's, here's some water. Verse 38, and he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Philip baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. Star Trek, gone, right? That is an amazing piece of scripture. The Lord our God that we serve is capable of doing things so absurd it blows my mind. So Philip is just caught up and the Ethiopian eunuch goes on his way rejoicing. Now we don't know his name but here's what we do know. Church historians and fathers will say that this Ethiopian eunuch goes back to his country, shares the gospel, a church is planted, a church is started. Some historians believe that the apostle Matthew goes to Ethiopia and in the, in the area uh, of, of this man and uh, disciples, Christians, uh, the gospel is taken to that land because of this moment. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached on all of the cities till he came to Caesarea. So he just finds himself wherever God wants him, and he just continues preaching the gospel. Now, the New Testament is full of stories like this, where God puts something into the heart of his people— and it doesn't make sense. And it may not always make sense. But if you follow his leading, you will see the miracles of God performed through your obedience. And I want to look at some of the dynamics of the story. Number one, Philip was in a position to hear from God. So he was living a life in humility and obedience to the Lord where he was positioned to hear from God. We can be Christians and you know, we, that's, our, that's our religion and that's who we follow. And we can be out of sync with the Lord in rebellion and not be in a position to hear the Lord. Philip was in a position to hear from God. He was living his life in a way that was pleasing to the Lord. And God chose to use him. Being in the right place in your heart with God allows him to test you and to trust you. Sometimes God allows us to go through little tests of obedience where the Lord will nudge us and say, hey, I want you to do this little thing. And if we're faithful in taking that step and obeying him, he can trust us with the next step and the next one and the next one after that. Being in the right place in your heart with God allows him to test you and then to trust you once you pass the test. He heard from God and then he obeyed. Now, it doesn't hurt that he heard from an angel. I don't know about you, but I've not physically been able to say, I have been in the presence of an angel. I may have, I don't know, but, uh, but Philip is told by an angel of the Lord, go down and walk this road. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, I want you to run by the chariot. In both of those inst inst instances, he heard from God and he obeyed. 
And he, he obeyed even though it did not make sense. And notice that God did not tell Philip about the eunuch beforehand. He didn't tell him about the chariot. He didn't tell him he'd be reading Isaiah or any of the details about the road. And sometimes, listen church, sometimes we don't fulfill the purpose of God in our life because we don't have the details. And we don't have the faith to trust when God puts something on our heart to do. And for you people that have to have all of the details and all of the information in order to take a step when God tells you to do something, I am sorry to inform you, but most every instance in the Bible of God telling someone to do something is when he tells them to do something without the information and without the details. And that's just the way he operates. He saw the opportunity and acted in boldness instead of cowering in fear. Now, was there fear present? Yeah, sure. He's on a strange road in a place that he didn't plan on being, and God tells him to run up beside this eunuch, this, this guy that's got a lot of authority, and present himself in a place where he doesn't know what the outcome's going to be. Sure, there was, there was the av availability for fear, but, but, but he acted in boldness and chose to go forward in the will of God. Number four, Philip prepared himself by knowing God's word. You see, the Lord had already placed it in Philip's heart to understand Isaiah. There were some small little instructions probably given to Isaiah to understand the word. Put the word of God in you when you don't need it so that it will be there when you do need it. God could trust Philip with this task because Philip had obeyed the Lord and he knew what the scripture said about Jesus in the book of Isaiah. He was prompted and he was ready because he had done the obedient work beforehand. Often God goes to somebody else or uses another person because I did not prepare myself by being obedient to his instructions. That's why studying the word of God is so important because when the Lord wakes you up and tells you to turn to a passage and study it, or the Lord puts it on your heart to get into a Bible study and understand this word, it may be for your benefit and for the people that he has divinely appointed you to meet in the future to show off the good love and grace of Jesus Christ. Your preparation in the gospel to, is, is meant not only for you and your benefit, but for the people God wants to work miracles in. And that's why we have to be obedient in the small steps of learning the word. He embraced this opportunity, and God gave him to lead the man to a relationship with Jesus. He embraced the opportunity. He saw the door open, jumped in, and shared the gospel. Verse 36 of that passage says, They traveled along the road. They came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, now this story, this is just one instance from Philip's life. Among We have no clue how many others. But God used him for a purpose in this man's life. And God wants to use all of us who follow Christ just like he did Philip to make miracles happen in other people. This display of love from God for this Ethiopian man is absolutely amazing. Because this man, he didn't know about Jesus. He's from another country. This man, he didn't know uh, what Isaiah was even talking about. But God set him up to receive Jesus because of his love for him. God instructed Philip to go to a place at a certain time to do a specific thing, and he didn't give him any details about that thing. He just said go, right? First, he said go by the desert. Thanks a lot, Jesus. How many of you are not called to walk down a desert road? Yeah, I'm not called to children's ministry. You didn't think I'd go there? Ooh, that's a big Jesus too. Man, that's a good one. A lot of times, God will tell us to go do things that we don't want to do because it doesn't match our personality or our desires or our life goals or our skill set or what we did as a career or we may get dirty or there may be variables where it's unsafe or it may cost me. 
Listen, the perfect place in your life is in the will of God where God determines, I think you should walk down this, this road. He said go and no, more, no other details. I'm sure that Philip could have said, this doesn't make any sense. I'm not really good at walking. I don't have the right shoes. <laughs> I just had my toes done. This isn't the best time, Jesus. We've got some things. I mean, we've got a really good revival happening here in Samaria. It's not really a good time for me to go walk down this road. What if nothing happens? What if I get out on this road and, I, and it's not the Lord and nothing happens? All right? All of those variables. God searches our hearts and God knows us. Before he asks us to do something, God understands the level of our faith and God already knows how much we trust in him. And so the level of the test that he gives us is to increase that so we can pass the next test, so we can pass the next test, so we can pass the next test and then grow. When my five-year-old daughter was learning how to ride a bicycle, it was, a, it was such a fun process. I'm completely being sarcastic because it was not a fun process. When you look at the little girl and you say, if you'll just learn how to ride without your training wheels, it'll be a lot more fun. No! If you'll just let me let go of this seat and you can glide by yourself, you can do it. No! Right? And you fight and you fight and you fight and you try to put in them the faith of life. You're going to have more fun when you learn to ride a bicycle without training wheels. And then there's the day where she gets it and you release the back of the seat that she's riding and she's like, woo, 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 woo. But all of a sudden the inner ear clicks in and she gets a little steady and that face lights up and she's got this massive smile. She's learned to ride a bike without training wheels. And you're like so happy because in the dad's mind, it's not just about letting her ride on her her own the dad has plans I want you to ride with me down the road I want you to ride with me somewhere I want us to ride bikes together and she didn't know that but the only way that she could ride with me and have better experiences is she, she got rid of the training wheels and she's got to pass that test and trust her dad and go through the hard work of getting it done and now we can go ride bicycles together and now that she can ride a bicycle I can teach her how to ride a motorcycle and then she can ride a motorcycle with me down the road hooray right you know what I'm talking about, Tristan? Yes, he's got his own motorcycle. I envy you, brother. Anyway, sometimes the tests, we don't understand them, but just like that analogy of letting go and trusting the Father and trying to ride a bike without training wheels when it's scary, it's the best thing we can do. Because the Father's tests are for the benefit not only of our lives and faith growing in Him, but for the people that it will impact down the road. Once he gets there on that road in the desert, he only sees the chariot, and he gets an instruction to go to it. And this man hears the gospel because Philip was willing to go in the first place. This man hears the gospel because Philip was sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. This man hears the gospel because Philip was ready since he had already learned the scripture. And let me just say this real quick. If you don't know scripture, if you don't know the scripture behind what you believe, then I ask you, do you believe it anyway? Because you can't have somebody else's faith. You can't believe something just because somebody told you. You don't need to believe anything that I say up here because I told you. It has to be from you searching the scriptures and understanding what does the word say about this belief? Because the foundation of your faith must be built on scripture. You have to know why you believe what you believe because of what you have seen in the Scripture. Study to show yourself approved, someone who can rightly divide the Word of God. Fear will prevent you from fulfilling God's purposes, and that's really what I want to get to today, is fear is the thing that keeps us from seeing the miracles in our life. Paul wrote Timothy and encouraged him to be a bold witness in a time of crisis for Christians. Timothy was a young pastor in the city of Ephesus. 300,000 people lived there. And Timothy is trying to, to share Christ with people. And he knows that there's some conflict with the people who resist Jesus. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 through 8, here's what Paul writes to him. I've been mind, reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity. That's a spirit of fear, being a coward. But the spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. What is self-discipline? 
willing into existence what you want to do. I'm going to put down everything else that would keep me from doing what I'm supposed to do, self-discipline. Do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner, but join in with me in suffering for the gospel of the power of God. Philip understood the power of the Holy Spirit, the love, self-discipline. He understood that and he was walking in it. Paul understood it as well because he's writing to Timothy to live his life in the purpose of Christ, not being led by fear, but being led by the Spirit through the opportunities for fear. When the Holy Spirit comes to you and gives you a calling from God and a purpose to fulfill, do not give in to the fear that attacks you. And church, let me just tell you, that's normal. It is normal to be called by God and then have an element of fear come and try to derail you. Every instance of Scripture that I can see where the Lord speaks to somebody to go do something or obey Him in, a, in, a, in an act of faith, there is the element of fear. Think about Mary, the young girl that God chose to bring Jesus into the world through her womb. And the Lord speaks to her and says, You, blessed among women, you're going to be with child. And it's going to be by the Holy Spirit. You're going to call him Emmanuel. She says, I don't even, I'm not even married. How, how can this be? And then her next statement is, your will, Lord. I'm paraphrasing, of course, and that's, the, but she submits, but there must have been such an opportunity for her to have fear. But she submitted herself to Jesus. So many other instances where you can see where there is the opportunity for fear and people making the best decision to follow Jesus without the details. So when the Holy Spirit comes to you and gives you a calling from God and a purpose to fulfill, do not give in to the fear that attacks you. What do you do with that fear? You push beyond it and fulfill what God is calling you to do. Now, back to brass knuckles. From 2001 to 2005, I served as a youth minister at a very small church in Florence, Alabama. When I got there, there were only two kids in the youth group, two teenage girls, age 14. Before I started at that church, I, I had worked a couple of years back with the Boys and Girls Club of North Alabama and was an afternoon tutor at one of their, uh, one of their clubhouses in the Cherry Hill Homes Project uh, Housing Authority. And so we would, we would go every, every afternoon and kids would get off the bus from school and they'd flood into the Boys and Girls Club and we'd help them finish their homework and give them snacks, play fun games with them, basically, you know, babysit them until their parents get off work and come get them from the Boys and Girls Club and they, they go home. And I'd gotten to know several of the kids, got to, you know, my face was familiar with some of the moms there. Uh, when I became a youth minister, I didn't have a big youth group, but I had two empty vans so we drove the vans to the projects and we just opened the doors and we said, anybody want to go to church? We got free pizza. Youth group, immediate. It's like adding water. Bam, youth group. I had these precious uh, senior uh, adult ladies that would give every Wednesday to come in and make a snack supper. And my youth group went from 2 to 15 to 35 to 46 to 65 like that. And we, it was such a fun time to be in youth ministry because you didn't have to have waivers for anything. Nobody asked for permission. Some of these kids would get on the bus and I'd say, what's your name? They'd give me a first name. I had no clue what their parents' names were or even if their parents knew we were taking them and we would just leave, right? Be back by 830. The, the only problem with growing a youth ministry that fast is you don't have a real good chance to tell the bad kids not to come. That's a joke. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Tough crowd, Kurt. Because we were going out into the world and just getting anybody who wanted to come in, we had knife fights we had to deal with. We had people fighting and people sneaking off and doing stuff they didn't need to do in the corridors of the room. You know, and that was okay because we were preaching Jesus. One of the biggest struggles that I have as a pastor is understanding why do, why do you want me to say this message? Why do you want me to preach this topic? Because it's really what I'm supposed to do. Is this really what I'm supposed to say? Am I, am I obeying you, Lord? Am I following you? I don't understand the details. A lot of times I'll pray, God, what do you want me to preach? And something will be laid on my heart, and I'm doing my best to just navigate by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And there are a lot of times I'll stand in front of people, and this has been 
you know, uh, this has been the statistic for my whole ministry. I'll stand before people and I'll start to preach and I'm thinking, does anybody really need to hear this? Do they already know it? Everybody already knows this, right? This isn't going to affect anybody. I'm just wasting their time. It's all these fears that come upon you. But you do your best to present the gospel. There was one night in that youth ministry full of kids. I feel like I'm trying to, to obey the Lord. I preach a message. It, I feel in my heart that it just falls on deaf ears. It kind of falls flat. Nothing, nothing really happens. There's no Holy Spirit bells and whistles. Nobody's running around, falling on the floor. Everybody, nobody's weeping and crying. Jesus isn't like, you know, it's not in a big deal, right? So I think, okay, maybe I miss God. I don't know. I did my best. So van doors are open. Kids are getting on the van, getting ready to take them back home. This precious 15-year-old girl walks up to me. Well, she's not precious. She, was, she didn't act precious at all. She walks up to me, and she says, here, I need to give you these. I was like, okay. Nice. They fit. Thank you. <laughs> Best pastor appreciation gift I've ever been given. Um, no, I said, why, why are you giving these to me? What's going on? And she said, well, I came here tonight to use them on her, but I don't, I don't want to anymore, and I need you to take them from me. Whatever the Lord had placed on my heart that I had no clue that she was even coming, I had no clue what was going on in her life, I had no idea that she was bringing brass knuckles to church to break the eye socket of another girl because she had talked bad about her and ruined her reputation in the community. I had no clue that was happening. But because I made a step of obedience to preach something I didn't understand I was supposed to, I didn't understand why I'm preaching, I don't know why I'm sharing, I don't know why God's got me there, I don't know what's going on. I'm just trying to be obedient. God messes with this girl's heart and comes in and changes her whole heart and attitude and she decides to submit herself to Jesus, follow lay down her right to beat this girl to a pulp and forgive her. And a miracle happened in that little girl's life and also that little girl's life who went home with a very nice face, right? Being in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing makes miracles happen. We, church, want to be a people of miracles. And we must pass the little bitty tests of obedience. We must walk in the Spirit when we don't have the details and we don't understand. We must open our mouths in the moments where we don't feel qualified and we feel intimidated. We must do the thing that God is calling us to do because the miracles are waiting and God's absurd love for his creation is calling us to go and be Jesus to them. Amen? I don't know what happened to this little girl, but I'm hoping that she is still walking with Christ. I know that the little girl she was going to hurt, as far as I know, her face is still good, which is a miracle. It's great. Because she could have put a wall up on her. I'm telling you, I wouldn't want to fight her. But miracles happen if we are willing to walk in step with Jesus. So let me ask you a question. Are you going to be the kind of person that wants the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God. You want the blessing of God. You want the answers prayer from God. You want the peace of God. You want the freedom that God gives. And you want all of that, but you are unwilling to step out in faith, in obedience to God when he doesn't let you know all the details. Are you going to be that person? Are you going to be like Philip? What if today... You're leaving church and you pull out of here and the Holy Spirit drops on your heart. I want you to get in your car this afternoon at 2 o'clock and I want you to drive out on Highway 99. And that's all he says to you. Well, how far am I supposed to go, Lord? Crickets. Who am I supposed to talk to, Lord? Where, where am I supposed to go, Lord? And he tells you none of that. He just tells you, I, just, I would like you to drive out on Highway 99. Are you going to be the person that says, okay, and look at your spouse and say, I don't know why I'm supposed to, but I'm supposed to go. And look at your kid and say, I don't know why I'm supposed to, but I'm supposed to go. And then obey him in the next 
and obey him in the next and obey him in the next to see the miracle. Are, you going to be, are we going to be that kind of a people? Because if we are, it could be that our actions spread the gospel to a whole other country or a whole other group of people or impact folks in a way that we could never imagine. Philip's one act of obedience sent the gospel to another nation. I'd like to be a part of that, wouldn't you? Amen. As the worship team comes, we're going to sing a song about being forgiven and his amazing love and the fact that God loves us. But I want you to sing it from the perspective that not only that God loves you, but he loves the other people in your life and the people that you haven't even met yet. And in an odd way, God gives us a absurd commands to follow. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, whatever you want me to give, I want to be obedient. Help me discern your voice, Lord Jesus. Help me understand your calling. And in the things where I want details and I'm not sure, in the areas, Lord Jesus, where I want information and there are sphere, I pray, Lord God, that you'd help me surrender that to you, to lay it at your feet, just to be obedient, God. Help me, Lord Jesus, live in a way that resembles what Philip was going through. He's just being obedient. And you showed miracles. There were miracles, Lord. I, I, I pray that we would see that as we walk in obedience with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me this morning? This message is for some of you because you're going to be asked to do an absurd thing this week by the Lord. Somebody's salvation may depend on it. Somebody's entire family's salvation may depend on it. So be obedient. In Jesus' name.